Hey, so I'm in Singapore right now, and this country is uh, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic, and it's done the best job so far of handling it compared to almost every other country in the world. And so, I mean, that's just a couple of examples. I mean, one of them is just the, the fact that the government has, in response to allegations of price gouging uh, for hand sanitizers or um, even for masks, uh, that the government itself has not only managed to have an adequate supply of both, but it's also uh, given them for free to uh, Singaporean citizens. Uh, for example, for hand sanitizers, uh, you were you receive a notice in the mail, and then you would go to a local pickup point with an empty bottle, and you would get as much you know a lot of hand sanitizer enough to last you a couple of months. Uh, there's and in fact, when the prevailing scientific you know uh, consensus became. Uh, agreed that masks would actually help. Uh, you know, that was not the case in the beginning, but now the scientific consensus is that it may help not, may, not necessarily you, but other people. Uh, when that consensus was reached, uh, Singaporeans were able to receive masks from their government free of charge. All of this, was, is, all of this happened uh, because the Singaporean government does not necessarily have to fear uh, competition. In other words, it's a, it's a democracy, but it's a de facto one-party state under what's called the PAP, uh, which is also the, uh, the party of Lee Kuan Yew, who's the founder of this country. And what Lee Kuan Yew's prevailing ideology was, uh, was simply having no ideology. And as a result of his guidance and his example, he was a prisoner of war uh, under Japanese occupation here in World War II. And under his guidance, uh, Singapore is now perhaps the most successful small country in the entire world. I haven't been to Luxembourg. Uh, it's possible. I mean, I haven't been to, you know, I've only st stopped over in Monaco. Uh, so it's possible there's some other country that's equivalent. But in terms of what Singapore has managed to accomplish uh, post-World War II and post-independence from Malaysia, uh, there really isn't any other country that, that can compare. And part of that is, you know, sort of embedded and the way it's able to respond because it is a de facto one-party state uh, within a democracy. Uh, in other words, you might have parties, uh, opposition parties prevailing, but only in, in a few districts uh, and not enough to actually boot out uh, the majority, which is the PAP. And, when the, and to its credit, when uh, opposition parties do prevail, the PAP tends to look into it and try to figure out what, what they're doing that's deficient. And because most of the time, the opposition parties within Singapore are just not very good. Um, the, the opposition candidates are oftentimes just, mm, to the extent that they're any good, the PAP tends to co-opt them or tends to recruit them into their own party, which leaves you with a lot of inferior candidates on the other side. Uh, that's one of the things the government here does very well politically. If you're a rising star, uh, they tend to make sure that you're part of the, you know, sort of the Michael Jordan party as opposed to an upstart uh, competition. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that they continue to su succeed here. Um, and as a one-party state, they don't have to do things like, you know, have a request for proposal uh, in order to have a transparent system. Uh, you know, some, one person can just make a phone call and order masks or hand sanitizers. Uh, one person can simply make, uh, submit a bid uh, and, and immediately negotiate the production of hand sanitizers under a contract. Whereas in, in a multi-party state, in order to prevent a system or in, or in order to prevent corruption, uh, there's usually a transparent process, uh, an auction that has to be followed, which slows things down, uh, which is considered to be a, a, an acceptable cost uh, you know, in terms of preventing corruption. And you can see why those checks and balances are removed during wartime. Uh, and which really sort of renders the idea of democracy, uh, you know, almost, um, almost sort of, not necessarily futile when it comes to protecting minority rights, um, but it does give you pause uh, to the extent that you uh, are, are an absolute believer in democracy as a vehicle to protect uh, minority rights rather than simply allowing a, the status quo to continue, uh, with the status quo, of course, being controlled by whatever the majority wants in a democracy. Now, despite all this, there are a lot of people outside of Singapore 
um, you know, that compete with Singapore, Name, notably Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea. Um, Singapore, well, Hong Kong is, is the financial center of Asia. Uh, Singapore is trying to take that 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 sort of a, a mantle away from Hong Kong. Um, now, South Korea uh, wants to be or or is the techn no, technology leader in Asia. Uh, Singapore wants us to take that away as well, or quite frankly, can already can already compete. Um, and of course, you've got Taiwan, which uh, has you know a strong military, uh, a lot of weapons purchases, and so on. Um, and you know they also want to compete. And then of course you've got Japan, which is fairly independent, um, but could also compete in in any area against any country. And so a lot of the you tend to see a lot of criticism online about and and elsewhere about Singapore, which I think comes out of that, you know, sort of friendly competition between these so-called allies within ASEAN. And what, I, what really bothers me is the quality of the discourse. Uh, people continue to argue that the, the Singapore does not have a democracy, which of course is, is not true. They do have a democracy. It's just that they are so, so good at co-opting um, competition that, you know, quite frankly, you know, you wouldn't want the competition or the opposition, most of the opposition candidates to win uh, because, you know, the whoever's in the PAP, they tend to be the best people. So what and, and you know, of course, you have situations where you can't, um, you know, the other criticism is, is a lack of free speech. Uh, technically, the only place that you can um, protest would be in one park. I think it's called Hong Lim Park. If you want to have a protest, uh, that's a consequence of post-World War II governance practicality you don't want anybody being able to being able to slow things down uh, especially if you're in danger of being invaded or of, of having people within the country uh, attempt to divide the country internally and that's especially dangerous in a diverse country like Singapore which has you know a nice little balance between Malays Chinese Tamils uh, and a lot of expats from all over all over the world because it is such a globalized place so these criticisms don't make any sense. And so what I'm going to do is just give you a, a simple way. If you really want to criticize Singapore, I'm going to give you a, a, a sort of a three ways to do it. The first way is uh, refugees. Uh, despite being one of the you know, strongest, most financially uh, stable countries in the whole world, Singapore does not accept refugees. Its immigration system is designed to uh, accept immigrants long term, only to the extent that they have specialized skills that uh, are not available internally. And so in other words, the immigration system, the refugee, um, you know, sort of uh, deficiency or negligence um, as part of the cooperative world um, order is something that is that the immigration system is just not ready to handle in this country. Singapore claims that it is a small country and therefore it cannot accept uh, refugees. It's, it's, it's claims that it's just, you know, it's, it would rather just pay money. Uh, it would rather pay, say, Thailand. Uh, to handle refugee applications uh, rather than try to integrate refugees within the country. And that excuse makes um, is a cop-out because, you know, in order for the refugee issue to be settled worldwide, it's a worldwide issue. And so each country, especially the ones with money um, and affluence, they have to be able to uh, play their part in order to have an, interna an international world order that is based on cooperation. So if you have some countries like Turkey and Jordan taking in a lot more than other countries, um, you know, that's not sustainable. Uh, it, may be a, it may be a good idea to, for them to take more um, if they're better able to resettle refugees based on, you know, language or other sort of natural fits. But, you know, you can't have a system where Canada takes, you know, 1,000 people. If you have a million people that need to be resettled, you cannot have a system where an international system, at least not one that's based on cooperation, where, you know, Canada takes in 1,000 people of the million, the United States takes in 5,000, uh, and then Turkey and Jordan and Iran and uh, a few other countries take in, you know, 500,000. Uh, that's just not sustainable. So the first way that you can criticize Singapore is, it's, is in this issue, in the idea that despite being affluent, it's not living up to its, um, it's not punching above its weight when it comes to its international obligations to the extent that you believe in cooperative international organizations. Um, and you can see how that's important in something like a pandemic, uh, but it's also important in other uh, crises. And Singapore in this issue has not stepped up. The second way, and perhaps the most devastating way that you can criticize Singapore, 
is that it still jails Jehovah's Witnesses. And the Jehovah's Witnesses are a, uh, a minority Christian um, sect uh, that has a well-founded uh, historical um, opposition to war. Uh, as, it's also a very successful sect. Um, and, you know, it, for example, uh, President Eisenhower's mother was a Jehovah's Witness. And, of course, that's quite ironic, right? You have somebody who's one of the greatest war generals in the whole in the history of the world whose mother was a Jehovah's Witness, uh, who was a pacifist. And so in this country, there is a mandatory military draft, and there are no exemptions for conscientious objectors. And so as a result, uh, Singapore does not recognize the Jehovah's Witnesses' claim to pacifism. And so you have people in jail simply because of their religious beliefs. That is true, and this is, this is quite devastating to the image of Singapore as a diverse country because you do have a society uh, that claims to respect all religions that does in fact suppress free speech uh, in order to maintain social harmony. And so think, you know, if, if you have that claim, but you start to make exceptions and carve-outs for some religions but not others, you're, you're really damaging your own, you know, your own sort of moral foundation. And it's true that Singapore's primary uh, expenditure in its annual budget is on the military. So you can see why they have an, an interest in maintaining a no-exceptions rule uh, when it comes to military uh, drafts for men. But that's still not an excuse to ignore a, an established religion's claim to pacifism, especially not in a country that's still very, very safe and has almost no risk of going to war anytime soon with its, soon with its neighbors. Um, and as a result of this, uh, you can see that you know, Singapore is, has, when you combine that with the fact that they don't accept any refugees, you can see that Singapore is, is starting to show some cracks in its ability to claim any sort of moral high ground. And that's why the treatment of Jehovah's Witnesses in any country uh, is, is something to be looked at if you're looking at a country that claims to be a moral country. Even the United States, which is also a country uh, that runs on military spending or that has a very high percentage of its budget or its annual spending uh, through the military, even the United States, which is also actively invol involved in wars all over the world and has military bases all over the world, even they allow exemptions for Jehovah's Witnesses, but not Singapore. Um, and so you can see that, you know, this is something that is that should be criticized quite openly. Um, and it's, it's, it's particularly problematic because I've, I've always said I like Singapore. I think Singapore is a great country. I think it is a successful country. But I've never said that Singapore is a moral country. And nobody can say that because of this issue. You cannot be a moral country if you do not, if you claim to be respect diversity, but you carve out exceptions against religions or against any group that has a well-founded claim uh, historically uh, and a legitimate claim to, pa to pacifism. When you start jailing pacifists, your status w with respect to anything based on morality goes away immediately. And so, you know, how you treat a vulnerable minority within your country is an indication of the moral direction that you're going. And so I've never said that Singapore is a moral country. I've said it's a practical country. And what's really odd is that in this case, the practical path, which is to make sure there are no exceptions to the military draft uh, in order to maintain equality um, w within that particular law, it's interesting because, and this is probably the one area where practicality does not, um, th does not work out, uh, the idea that total equality when it comes to enforcement of the rules uh, that, that idea that it's always the case that you need to enforce the rules equally, uh, that's where the Jehovah's Witnesses create problems for governments uh, because if they do create an exception, uh, then they have, you know, just like what, what, what happened to Muhammad Ali with the Nation of Islam when he uh, demanded CO status, conscientious objector status, 
um, so, so as not to fight in Vietnam, which was an unjust war, um, something that he was right about. If the idea was, if the government allowed him to gain that exception, the Nation of Islam would suddenly gain a lot of followers who would then also claim the exemption. And that was something the government was very concerned with. And so when it went all the way to the Supreme Court, they found a loophole, a very, very narrow way to give Muhammad Ali his CO status, but without, unanimously, by the way, uh, but without allowing that uh, loophole, uh, or without allowing others to jump on uh, his CO status as well, simply by joining the same group. Um, and so there's clear, there are clearly ways of, of resolving these practical problems, but Singapore has so far not managed to find a middle way. Even the United States found that way for one of its minorities uh, during wartime. Of course, it wasn't an easy path. Uh, Muhammad Ali went bankrupt at some point. At one, at one point, uh, he was stripped of his title, um, and this was particularly problematic because in, in many states, even if you are a felon, uh, you're still allowed to box, but not Muhammad Ali. He was not allowed at any point in time during this sort of you know, situation where he was claiming you know, CO status until, it went, until his case went to the Supreme Court. He was not allowed to box anywhere in the state, uh, anywhere in, in, in the country. Um, and so, again, this is one, another way that you can criticize Singapore. You've got the refugee status issue the fact that it's not living up to its international obligations, uh, despite easily being able to do so. And, you know, from a practical perspective, they only have to accept 10 people. I mean, they can do something, right? It's not that hard. Uh, but as long as they don't accept those 10, 20, 100 people every year, uh, it becomes very difficult for Singapore to ever claim any sort of moral uh, leadership anywhere in the world. When you combine that with its treatment of Jehovah's Witnesses, you've got a secondary problem that supports this idea that Singapore is not a moral nation. A third way uh, that you can criticize Singapore is in its, um, what you might call, uh, you know, the fact that it's fallen behind similar nations, similar developed nations, uh, when it comes to uh, gay marriage and gay rights. And Singapore, because of its, its you know, social harmony objective, um, has basically created a don't ask, don't tell uh, scenario when it comes to uh, when it comes to gay relationships. And so I personally haven't seen anybody, uh, you know, uh, hold, you know, sort of kiss uh, a cu gay couples kiss in the streets. But, you know, within some cultures, you know, it's quite common to see men and men, hold, both two men holding hands or two women holding hands. Uh, so you're actually better off in some countries well, you just wouldn't know uh, what the intent was behind, you know, same-sex people holding hands. Um, and so this, is, might, this might be one of the countries where that could apply. Um, but even if somebody did kiss in public, the country has not prosecuted anybody under any sort of laws. And so it hasn't gotten to the point where, you know, it, it has, it, it's actually trying to, to discriminate against people openly based on their sexual orientation. So that is actually similar to what the United States had uh, under Bill Clinton, uh, don't ask, don't tell. And that was under that, that policy was under a uh, liberal democratic president, and this is sort of the same policy that Singapore is following. Now, the the problem with that uh, is that you know, when you combine it with the other two issues, social issues, you've got this pattern of of you know un being unable to find an acceptable middle ground, which is causing again a a loss of leadership morally, which is not something the country. Um, ever had to deal with under LKY, the founder of the country. As long as they had LKY, uh, they had a claim to, to morality. They had a claim not just to practicality, uh, but also morality, which does not exist anymore post the uh, death of LKY. And so this third issue is particularly problematic because the grandson of LKY has now moved to South Africa. Uh, it turns out that his grand, the grandson of the founder of the country uh, is gay. And he was married in South Africa, and he's no longer in the country now. The United States, uh, you know, still has the Kennedys, you know, living in Boston somewhere, um, or in Massachusetts somewhere, uh, despite the fact that they keep dying at really high rates, sadly and tragically, um, they, they're still there in, in, the, in the U.S. Um, and so you've got a situation where you have a small country that can't manage to hold on uh, to one of the grandkids of the founder, which is, again, an indication that the country isn't maximizing its potential.
Um, if the United States can still keep the Kennedys, you, you would think that the founders uh, of Singapore would be able to uh, figure out a way to keep one of the grandsons of the, fo uh, of the founding uh, president. So you've got that issue, the third issue, uh, and you know, like I said, that's probably a situation where it might be one of the weaker issues to criticize Singapore about because, again, there are no prosecutions. Uh, nobody's going to jail because of, of you know, homosexual relationships uh, or anything else. There's plenty of transgender, transgendered people. Um, you know, nobody's being bothered because of, what their, of their sexuality. Um, so despite having these laws um, on the books, uh, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, or, you know, Singapore is quite open sexually. Um, I believe uh, you can, it is legal to purchase sex, but not to solicit it, uh, sex. And so the, the whole idea behind that kind of a law is to keep things behind closed doors, out of the public view. Uh, and so this is not a country that's puritanical by any means. Uh, so I, I, that would be the, the third point would be the weakest point, but it's still not something that helps the country's image. Uh, especially not when it comes to moral leadership. And so if you want to criticize Singapore, you know, the first two, it's failure to have a, a refugee policy, and it just has no refugee policy uh, for the country itself. Uh, that would be the easiest way to criticize a country. Uh, the second way uh, is, again, what we've just discussed. Um, and so ultimately, you've got you know, a situation where there are many ways to criticize Singapore, but the ones that people tend to criticize the country about uh, don't make any sense. And I don't know if that's a deliberate. Uh, in other words, I don't know if it's a strategy to keep attention away from these issues uh, relating to minority rights, um, which is what the second and the third issues discussed were about. I don't know if that's a deliberate sort of, you know, uh, misdirection. Uh, but at least there's something on the record where if you want to criticize the country in 2020, uh, there are at least two and probably three ways of doing it, uh, you know, and, and out of a way that, you know, sort of out of an intent where if you criticize a country, uh, you still have to remember it's still a great country. And the reason for your criticism would be to make it an, an even better country. Uh, and this is something that's particularly important after the founder's death, uh, because it is going to be difficult for the country to retain its best people to the extent that it, ha that it has policies that even drive away uh, one of the grandsons of the founder.